We've got 400 pages and many hundreds of years in this book. Welcome. We thank Boswell Bookshop here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for hosting this interview in partnership with Porchlight Book Company. Um, I'm Sally Halderson, Managing Director of Porchlight, and it's very fitting to have this wonderful text published in March, National Women's Month, and to speak to Lillian Faderman, author of the newly published Woman, the American History of an Idea. Lillian is an internationally known scholar of lesbian and LGBTQ history, literature, as well as ethnic history and literature. She is an award-winning gender and sexuality scholar, Professor Emeritus at California State University, Fresno. She's authored many influential books, such as biography of Harry, Harvey Milk, Gay LA, The Gay Revolution, and Odd Girls and Twilight Lovers. Three of her titles have made the New York Times Notable Books of the Year list. And Lillian, we are so pleased to have you here. And we are all so lucky that you are gonna start out our hour with you with a short reading from your new book. Thank you so much for having me, Sally and Daniel. And I will um, read from uh, the introduction of the book, the first uh, three pages or so of the book. I grew up in the 1950s, surrounded by images of women that had nothing to do with me or most of the girls who were my classmates at Hollenbeck Junior High School in East Los Angeles. Radio and TV images of middle-class wives and mothers like Harriet Nelson and June Cleaver, always in the bosom of their tidy families, did not apply. Nor did the few commercials that featured a working woman, usually a well-groomed blonde secretary. Nor did the ubiquitous warnings to girls to avoid premarital sex, lest they become damaged goods. The girls I went to school with were mostly from immigrant families. Many of them were pachucas, gang girls, who wore short, tight skirts and see-through nylon blouses and engaged in petty outlawry. That was their answer to the stifling mores their parents had brought with them from Mexico and to the white world that disdained them. They were often in trouble as, quote, juvenile delinquents. I, one of the few white girls at Hollenbeck, was also the daughter of an immigrant, an unwed Jewish woman from Eastern Europe who made a living sewing dresses in a downtown LA garment factory. I too was a juvenile delinquent of sorts because I had already discovered my outlaw sexuality and would soon be going to gay girls bars, flashing a fake ID that said I was an adult. The dominant images of women that I and my Pachuca classmates could not avoid knowing about through radio, TV, movies, billboards, magazines, sermons, laws, textbooks, and teachers had no resonance for us, yet their effect on us was inescapable. It was not unusual for my Pachuca classmates to fall into the juvenile justice system and be sent to juvie as they called LA's juvenile hall. If their crimes were bad enough, burglary, serious assault or prostitution, for example, they were sentenced to the Ventura School for Girls, which despite having the name that sounded like a posh boarding school, was a reform school for what the staff psychiatrist called prize recalcitrance. But throughout the 1950s, these school's enlightened methods were intended not only to discourage antisocial behavior, but also to reform the girls by inculcating in them the dominant culture's ideal of womanhood. To that end, they were visited by wholesome looking Hollywood starlets, the studio's idea of a publicity stunt perhaps, who modeled twirly feminine frocks. They were given charm classes and classes in office skills. They were taken by volunteers, citizens of Ventura, to church services to hear sermons on good morals. The indoctrination often did not work. Students scaled the wall and escaped the Ventura School for Girls so often that finally a security fence had to be built. 
However, they could not escape knowing the dominant culture's idea of woman and that they had fallen short of it. As for me, I could easily have been caught in a gay bar raid and ended up at the Ventura School for Girls too. Instead, by a lucky encounter in the nick of time, I ended up in a PhD program at UCLA. That was not where young women, a young woman was supposed to be in 1962, but the long forgotten women's writers of the previous century had made a space in PhD programs for women like me who could not go along with the feminine mystique. I entered the program gladly, yet as aware of myself as a fugitive from the ideal of woman as were my Pachuca classmates. How, when, and why had that ideal of woman been created? Why had its grip been so tenacious as to reach even into our poor and neglected little world? And how did it become possible to contest it and to live a life outside of it? Woman began as a personal quest to answer those questions. As someone who has been writing about history for a half century, I naturally look to the past, the 20th century leading me backward to the 19th, then to the 18th, and finally the 17th, when Europeans first began to populate this country. I wanted to know who had a hand in formulating the dominant idea of woman that I had been so aware of, even as I rebelled against it, who had dared to rebel against it in other centuries, what were the forces that finally brought about seismic changes in the concept of woman? And why have traces of the early concept stubbornly remained even into the present? And I'll stop here. So many good questions, but I want to start with, it is such an honor to meet you, you. Um, to have this opportunity for all of us to learn from you. And what it means to be woman in America is such a current and changeable thing. But with this book, Woman, the American History of an Idea, you show us that it always has been. So we're gonna start there. Um, this book follows a fairly strict historical timeline beginning in the 1700s, for those of you who have not yet read it. Um, and then more stylistically, you take each notable time period and open it up so we can look inside like a pop-up book or episodic television. Um, and as you mentioned in the, in the piece that you read, um, to see who dared to um, define what woman is, who dared to rebel against who woman is, and you show that in these little pop-ups through time and opening up this timeline. So how did you decide on this format of the book and to, to start in the 1700s and, and follow the timeline forward? Well, I wanted the, the book to, to be chronological, but I also wanted to follow themes. For instance, uh, from the beginning, I look at the idea of woman in the public square and how she was forbidden the public square. And Hutchinson was banished in the 17th century because she tried to be in the public square. Mary Dyer was hanged. Of course, we all know the story of the uh, witches in the uh, 17, uh, 1650s and the uh, 1690s. I was uh, particularly interested in the notion that, as, as one magistrate said, um, women should not be a rash rambler abroad. Anne Hibbins was a rash rambler abroad. She went around checking on the credentials of some carpenters who had worked for her, and she was hanged as a witch because of it. <laughs> So I, I tried to, to figure out when women could probably uh, possibly take a, a position in the public square. Surprisingly, it was not during the revolution. And so I, I returned to that theme of the public square and how, how hard women wanted to think nationally, as one of them says during the American 
revolution. And they were discouraged from doing that. They were uh, encouraged to boycott tea, to boycott other British products, to go back to spinning and weaving so there wouldn't have to be British imports. But that was very clearly the only role they could take in the public square during the revolution. And so my, my big question as I was uh, writing these chapters is when did it begin to change? Mm -hmm. And I, I got really excited discovering how it began to change. So men had to build a new country and there was no place for women in the building of that country except in the propagation of mankind as a, a 17th century pundit had said. And so women uh, had to be somehow occupied and thinking they were doing something important for the company and what could it be? And I, I found a, a number of uh, suggestions of what that was. One was uh, a 1795 article that talked about uh, the importance of women's moral influence mm -hmm. on men that is it was only women because they were they were somehow morally purer than men they didn't have the raging appetites that men had it was women who could make men better and uh, an, an 1810 sermon that said the same kind of thing women were were pure and it was their job to to make men uh, uh better human beings and therefore better citizens. And so what, what did that mean finally for women? They decided, well, if, if we're so pure, we need to speak up, we need a public voice. And so they began to, to establish things like the first moral reform mm -hmm. societies that were led by women. And what that meant essentially was um, trying to get rid of prostitution. And they learn not only how to organize through these moral reform societies, but they, uh, they also learned how to petition legislatures all over the country. There were like 500 moral reform societies led by women and they petitioned legislatures and they made seduction uh, illegal, punishable by a fine and time in prison. They had um, these wonderful magazines. They were kind of like, it was sort of like an early Me Too movement mm -hmm. because some of those magazines <laughs> asked um, women all over the country and in, in rural areas and in, in uh, small towns to uh, send in the names of seducers, of, of men who were going around doing terrible things to, to women. Um, but in any case, women learned how to publish magazines and distribute magazines. The same was true of the early temperance movement. If women were so pure and if the home was their bailiwick, then they had a right to demand that the home be pure, that men stop drinking, stop using the wages that the family needed by drink. And so they they uh, began these temperance organizations all over the country. And I, I loved some of the stories that I found, um, like a, a woman by the name of Hannah Jumper in New England, who managed to organize most of the women in, in her little town. Um, and they uh, decided on a day when they would march through the town, go to all the saloons, demand that these saloons be closed down, uh, told the uh, patrons of the saloons that they had to get out of there and they carried axes long before carry nation they carried axes a very unwomanly thing to do but a, a real step into the public square so to answer your question uh, my book is organized chronologically but organized thematically too along te themes such as that one I on two points in there I think though something that makes the book so enjoyable to read as a as a history is um, me is the is the opportunity to meet each of these women that you've all you've already given given us um, some cameos here in in who you've been just describing but also that with each chosen story with each woman that you have featured, I don't know the right analogy, but it's it's progressive, right? It's um, it's layering, it's 
it's small steps equaling big steps and sometimes steps back and sometimes steps forward. But at the same time, what allows those steps to happen is this constraint, right? Or this prison that you, that you use at times during the book, um, this definition of the idea of, of woman and what you're talking about in terms of the like reformers, um, it shows how inconstant this, this, this definition is, right? Because earlier it was women are temptress, woman is temptress, and then we have woman is reformer. And so each time woman becomes something, the definition gets, you know, manipulated so that they fit even less into whatever yes. the definition is. Yeah, and I, I think your point about woman is temptress is a very good one. One of the reasons that the Puritans gave for the severe repression of women in the 17th century is that they were daughters of Eve who ruined the world. And it was Adam's job now to, to redeem the world. And, and women had to be silent. They had to be silent in church. They had to be silent vis-a-vis -vis their husband. And, and it was because of the original sin, not of Adam, but of Eve. Mm -hmm. um, let's um, stick with the sort of your, the conceptual and construction of this book a little bit so that I make sure that we cover these. Um, the title of your book is Woman. And as I talk about the book with friends and, and people at work, it, it's, it's a challenge um, because language is a challenge, right? Language is a decision. Even as I'm using the word history, all of my, you know, um, experience with testing out her story versus history and, and everything we talked about in the 90s about changing words then and now changing language now. So you're, I'm sure you're very specific about the language you used to define this book. And so um, I think it's very deliberate that you did not um, name it women, that you did not um, alter woman as as the chosen noun um and is that because there's there's no such thing as the plural of woman there's no such constant definition are you challenging that um and can every woman define the term independent of this sort of hegemonic definition but what i wanted to say through the title and the subtitle as well is that woman is a construct mm -hmm. <laughs> pardon me it's um it's a uh, construct that was sometimes held uh, kept to hold women down it's a construct that was very often uh, established by man i i still love what Simone de, Bar de Beauvoir said about uh, um, woman, one is not born, but one becomes a woman, or what Judith Butler said about how uh, being female and being woman are two very different kinds of being, uh, or what uh, Monique Wittig said about the prison of woman and had, how women had to kill off woman because woman was a construct that uh, was almost invariably defined in the certainly in early centuries by men and it was not one that permitted women freedom of, of choice and freedom of self-definition so what i i do is uh, i present how this construct get us got established and how women challenged it and how some women did not challenge it. And what I've discovered is what um, Buddhists long, long ago discovered, that is the, um, the only constant is change. And that has certainly been true for the concept of woman. The, um, and also true, I think, for the, um, how each person is comfortable with any kind of label, right? It is really up to the, up to the individual and in how they um, embrace or reject terminology, labeling, language. 
And did you feel any sort of push to um, make this book more of a criticism than a history? Well, one can't help being critical of so many of the insane ideas through the <laughs> centuries. And so, of course, I, I'm often very critical. Um, but my my goal was to to trace the history, how how the idea got established here. I, I was so interested in in discovering what uh, the Europeans found on this continent, um, the Native Americans who in many tribes in many Native American nations, the idea of woman was so different from what the Europeans had known and what they wanted to establish here. I, I tell a story that I found particularly remarkable. This was uh, in the uh, uh, 1620s. Roger Williams, who was a major figure uh, among the Pur Puritans until he got cast out of uh, mm -hmm. Massachusetts Bay Colony and went to Rhode Island, um, he, he wrote to the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop, about um, the terrible uh, Pequot Wars in which the colonists had uh, raided a Pequot village, killed many men, women, and children. And the Pequots uh, gave up, they surrendered, they wanted to form a peace treaty with the colonists. And as so often happened with the Pequots and so many other Native American nations, they sent a woman as peacemaker. Mm -hmm. And Roger Williams wrote to John Winthrop, um, we questioned her much as to her truth and sent her home. They weren't going to negotiate with her. And then another woman was sent by the Pequots as uh, to negotiate peace. And, and he said, we questioned her as well and sent her home. And then four women and an old man were sent to try to negotiate the peace. And this time they, uh, the colonists were willing to talk to the old man, not to the four women. Um, so they, I think the colon, colonists simply could not conceive mm -hmm. of a society where women had any kind of power. And of course, in many of the tribes, uh, women were in charge of uh, food production, ag agriculture, food distribution. Um, they, uh, they were somewhat matrilineal in many of the tribes. Uh, it was the uh, daughters that inherited from the mothers. Um, in many tribes, uh, it was the woman who decided when a marriage was over. She simply put the husband's possessions outside and, and that was a sign that she wasn't having it. And as um, one uh, 17th century traveler said about uh, women in, in uh, the Algonquins that um, she, she was her own person. She could uh, do whatever she wants in terms of her body. Um, nobody told her what to do and certainly no male of the family told her what to do. And this was uh, absolutely bizarre to the colonists who had such a different idea of who woman was. I, it's those stories that just, um, are so absorbing in the book, stories that I have never read and um, informs my understanding of what has come before, obviously that that is um, meaningful to how much we have progressed regardless of how much has been rescinded as well, that back and forth that we've been talking about. Um, let's move a little further into um, the a little more recent past. 
but not very much. Um, in chapter five, uh, you title 19th century woman leaves home. And in chapter six, it's woman goes to college and enters the professions. And as with all books, you know, the, the reader who comes to the book interprets the book um, in a way that resonates. And for me, I started to read the book almost as though woman was the protagonist of this book and we, and we are on a hero's journey. And we are, um, as we watch the um, progress and the challenges and you know, of all the stories, the riddles, the rhymes, the, the um, troll under the bridge, all of this as we sort of progress over this timeline. And I'm wondering if you think that's a crazy interpretation or um, do you feel like woman is a character who has grown and matured? And if so, where is she at in her evolution now? I, I, I like your interpretation, but I, I, it worries me a little bit because it, it sounds as though the book uh, agrees with an essentialist notion of right. woman. And of course, my big argument in the book is that there, uh, there is no essentialist yeah. woman, although uh, men have tried to say there was. And women, even in recent times, some women have tried to say there was. And so what I... What I attempt to show is that, uh, as I said, woman was a construct. Uh, uh, women, plural, have often fought against the essentialist notion of a woman. Uh, women of color have shown us that uh, it means something very different to be mm -hmm. a woman of color from what it means to be a white woman. Um, the class issue is very important. The transgender issue has become very important and is so much in the news now, and I address that issue. So, no, I, I, I guess I can't say that it's it's woman's uh, heroic journey because you know what woman? <laughs> right, right, right. right. I, I'm just I, uh, I'm reminded too of of a poem that. Um, I found so interesting at the height of the feminist movement, um, I, I first found it uh, in the 1970s, was written by a, a black woman who was a member of the Combahee River Collective. Uh, her name was Lorraine Bethel. I think she was a graduate of Yale, but the poem is called, What You Mean We, White Woman, Mm -hmm. Meaning that the story for Black women about a woman and even the feminist story is very different. And I, uh, I, I want to make that really clear in the book. And that, that is uh, one of my main goals to show that not only is there no woman as men defined women and as some women complicit, com with complicity defined woman, but um, there, there, woman is just so dependent on race and class and era and right. geography and so many things that uh, that would combat the essentialist notion of woman as all the same. Right. <laughs> Which of course was, and and that's a point that I I make about. Um, woman in the 17th century, you know, men were beginning to define themselves as, as individuals. Uh, you were an artisan or you were a merchant or whatever, but woman was all the same, um, except of course for Native American women. And there was a real attempt to make them like white women um, in the 18th century. Um, George Washington is our first president. Um, had a, a meeting with the uh, Cherokee and um, told them that, uh, told the male leaders that the women have to learn how to uh, spin and weave like white women do. They have to stop doing this agriculture. The men have to start doing agriculture and stop hunting and stop hunting, of course, because they had to stop taking up the land 
where the uh, white settlers wanted to settle. Um, and of course, uh, in, in the times of, of slavery, uh, enslaved women were not considered woman as woman was defined. A uh, woman was defined by her motherhood. Woman was defined by her sexual modesty. Enslaved women by the slavers weren't permitted those things. So uh, enslaved women were outside of the definition of woman. I think that section is, um, you make it very clear um, how different the allowances or the, um, that I feel like that word is, I mean, that's not the right word, that the, um, the, the definers um, of what woman is at any given time, but particularly at that time were, again, creating a sort of inconstant that suited themselves and suited the, the limitations that they wanted to place on each woman, because there were exceptions made for in different um, relationships or scenarios. And you tell stories about that, about, diff about marriages that worked differently, about households that worked differently, communities that work differently. And we get a real sense of um, sort of dismantling my own hero's journey interpretation that that each each um, effort to move forward was either hindered or helped depending on the individual circumstance. Yes, it, it was also interesting to me, the way in which women sometimes hindered the effort to move forward, how women were sometimes complicit in this battle to escape from woman. And frequently, women who you certainly would not suspect could become complicit. I'm thinking, for instance, of, of uh, Catherine Beecher, she's the first woman that I, I write about uh, who was extremely complicit that I found astonishing because it was uh, do as I say, not as I do. Catherine Beecher wrote, she was yep. uh, educated. She really had a sense of herself. She was a powerful woman. She actually started a school for girls um, but she made it clear that although she thought they should uh, study serious subjects like philosophy, she wanted them to study domestic philosophy mm -hmm. or chemistry. She wanted them to study domestic chemistry. And what she meant by that is if, if you study chemistry, you know why food goes bad, for instance. And so it's a preparation for, for being a, a better wife and mother. And the whole idea was, well, it was the concept of Republican motherhood. Women should be educated so they could educate their sons because of course, boys had to be educated because they were gonna be men who, who vote. And I, I trace a, a number of women like uh, Catherine Beecher, um, Sarah Josepha Hale was a fascinating woman. She was the editor of Godey's Ladies Book at a time when there was no such thing as a woman editor. So she had this high powered job and she used it to, she was in favor of education, I should say. She, mm -hmm. when, when Vassar was started, she really promoted that. But other than that, she used her high powered jobs to tell women that they had to be good wives, that even if they didn't have a good husband, uh, that was the husband that God gave them. And they had to give him the respect that was due to, uh, to a husband. Um, when, when suffrage became an issue, she was vehemently in the pages of Godey's Ladies book, vehemently anti-suffrage. And I, I trace this um, even into later eras. Um, I, I'm really fascinated by uh, 
Phyllis Schlafly, for instance, in the 1970s. Phyllis Schlafly ran for Congress twice. Phyllis Schlafly wrote a, a best-selling book about, she was always very conservative. It was about, and in fact, it, it, it really put Barry Goldwater forward in 1964, a choice, not an echo, and he became the presidential nominee. Um, Phyllis Schlafly um, was, was uh, very interested in organizing on, on a large scale. And yet she told women that a woman has a right to be a woman. We don't want equal rights. We want our special privileges. Oh. What was she doing then? <laughs> but, and, and she's, she's only one of, of mm -hmm. just this long line of women who achieved huge success and uh, spent their careers telling women that they should not want huge success. They should want to be wives and mothers. How difficult is it to tell the stories of these women? I suppose knowing that they um, they moved the needle forward, perhaps in some scenarios. Um, as you mentioned a few, and I had a couple in my notes here, um, M. Carey Thomas, um, who did all that she could to advance women's opportunities at Bryn Mawr, but you wrote, um, shared some of her days horrific blind spots with, in terms of her racism and classism. And, you know, even the women who had opportunities during the wars where they were able to um, activate themselves in the name of patriotism. We see this with suffrage as well. Like there were many people left behind in the pursuit of suffrage and the, the accomplishments in it. And so how difficult, I mean, this is, maybe that's not a Good way of putting it, but how challenging is it to to address this intersectionality when we're talking about a history that is so limiting? Yes, very challenging, um, particularly in in our day with with our present sensitivities. Mm -hmm. When I first discovered M. Carey Thomas, it was. Um, when I was working on my book, Odd Girls and Twilight Lovers, uh, so this, the book came out in 91. So I first discovered her in the 1980s and she was absolutely my hero. This was a woman who in the 1870s wanted a PhD and there was no place she could get one in the United States. And so she and the woman who was her partner went off together to, uh, to Europe. She finally ended up in um, uh, 1882 getting a PhD with honors from the University of Zurich. She had such a sense of self-confidence in, in the 1880s. Here she was in her uh, early 20s, and she had heard that a new college was starting for women, Bryn Mawr, and she put herself forward as the, uh, she wanted to be the president of the college. She didn't get that job, but she got the uh, job as the dean of the college. And because James Rhodes, who was the president was often ill, she took the role of president. And then she did become the president. And a lot of the colleges were, uh, they were offering home economics courses for women. She said, we're not having that. We're not having any home economics courses at Bryn Mawr. She, um, she offered a PhD to students at, at Bryn Mawr. It wasn't just a liberal arts college. You could get a PhD from Bryn Mawr. She um, encouraged young women to go into professions. 90% of Bryn Mawr graduates worked in some sort of professional capacity. How could you not admire a woman like that? And then um, after I, I uh, published uh, Odd Girls and Twilight Lovers. Um, I wrote about her again in um, uh, my book, To Believe in Women. And by then I was beginning to discover things about her that I found really upsetting. She was anti-Semitic. Um, she uh, said specifically that she wouldn't hire Jewish professors because uh, it was much better to have people like us, meaning, uh, most of her students who were WASP. Um, she said that she wouldn't permit uh, black students to 
go to Bryn Mawr because there were too many uh, students from the uh, South and the Midwest who would be uncomfortable with Black students. Horrifying yeah. things. And there's, there's no getting around how horrifying those things were. And so I, you know, I've, I, I have personally been very perplexed about how to deal with M. Carrie Thomas. And I decided that the best way to deal, it, deal with it was simply lay it all out. The wonderful things that she did and the awful things that she did. And, and she was also a little bit inexplicable. For instance, she, as I said, she was anti-Semitic, but in the 1920s, just before she retired, she encouraged um, a, a, a summer school at Bryn Mawr for women laborers, mm -hmm. and particularly women who were in um, were seamstresses, who were in the garment industry, as my mother was. My mother didn't go to that school, but um, something like 30% of the students were Jewish in that school and surely she knew that. So, you know, how, how do you reconcile her disgusting anti-Semitism with that? I don't know how to reconcile it except to, to observe it and point out that it's, it, of course it's horrifying, but nevertheless, she uh, really advanced the needle as far as the position of woman was concerned. I wanna make sure that we get this in um, to branch off of, I think we'll get back to that same same um, topic, but your work in your writing, your advocacy, your life has been focused on LGBTQ history and the community. And throughout this book, you bring in stories of lesbian and transgender um, women throughout the history of woman. Um, how did does sharing these stories work to expand the contemporary boundaries that are that are you know being dismantled right now? in how we understand what it is to be woman. Yeah, I, I think the, the trans issue has really also moved the needle forward in the mm -hmm. most interesting ways, uh, particularly with Gen Z. Um, in, in a recent poll that I saw, uh, Gen Z, uh, the uh, uh, pollsters were interested in uh, people from uh, Gen Z, that is young people today, mm -hmm. who were in their teens and their early 20s. 35% of them said that they either themselves or among their friends and acquaintances prefer to be uh, called they rather than he or she. So I, I think the whole discussion of, uh, of non-binary identities is really mm -hmm. raising such interesting questions about the concept of, of woman. Um, I, I did a, a very interesting interview with a trans woman um, who was a psychiatrist and uh, she wanted to um, do the interview under a pseudonym because she said she didn't want, and she's stealth, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, she passes, uh, uh, nobody knows that, that she's a trans woman. She, she's mm -hmm. simply a woman. Um, but her point, is, so I did uh, the interview un, uh, under a pseudonym, but her point was that um, just as Kinsey uh, had a Kinsey scale that went from zero to six, um, describing sexuality, zero meaning totally heterosexual, six meaning totally homosexual. There, there needs to be a scale in terms of gender that goes from zero to six, zero meaning totally masculine, six meaning totally feminine. The uh, psychiatrist that I'm talking about said that she was a six. She felt herself to be totally feminine and felt that, and it was so interesting to me that she used these um, um, sort of old fashioned definitions of feminine. So I, I asked what that meant to her. And she said, well, from my childhood, I was always more caring and more gentle. And mm. that was femininity to her. But I think her point was, and it's my point as well, that, uh, there are a lot of people who are ones and twos and threes and fours and fives in terms of gender. And I think we're beginning to understand that 
much more than we did even in the 20th century, that, uh, that very few people are totally male or masculine or totally feminine. And indeed, if I may continue this for another minute, uh, the, uh, there was a very interesting Pew Research poll in 2019 um, that uh, asked, um, are you, uh, do you, do you consider yourself uh, totally masculine for men? And do you consider yourself totally feminine for women? One fourth of the men, this was in 2019, said they were totally masculine. Three fourths mm. of the men said they were not. Right. And one fifth of the women said they were totally feminine. And the rest of the women said they were not totally feminine. So I think more and more we're recognizing that, that gender is so much more complicated than was granted in the right. 17th or 18th or 19th or 20th century, and even early in our century. And I tell some interesting stories in the book about that as well. There's there's so much to read in here, and there, there are as you just said, there are so many interesting stories. We do have to wrap up. We've already used our time um, talking about only um, a small amount of engaging and intriguing and troubling things in this book. So um, the last thing I think I would ask you if we can just take a couple more minutes of, of our folks' time is, um, whether you feel like you answered through your book any of those questions you asked originally in terms of um, whether we are still imprisoned by this definition of woman or if those boundaries have disintegrated. Yes, I, I, deal, I, I deal with that in the epilogue to my book. Um, and in fact, the epilogue is called The End of Woman? Question uh, mark. I don't know. Uh, as I said earlier, the only constant is change, and it's very difficult to predict the future. It's hard to think we will ever go back, but I, I even present a possible dystopian scenario that might send us back in, in the epilogue, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, an, it is a fascinating exploration and a fascinating journey and to what has brought us to now. And um, we are so thankful for your time and your um, great intellect and you have us thinking. And um, this is a tribute to all of the people and all of um, those people who define themselves as women um, who have come before us. Mm -hmm.